Well, hello, congregation, family and friends, and Bereans. I pray that all is well with you. Thank you for joining me here on the Thursday broadcast. To those who are tuning in on Facebook, I welcome you. Have you subscribed to the YouTube channel? We're live over here on YouTube. I hope that you have subscribed to my YouTube channel as that is now our new platform. Uh, we've moved off of Periscope and on to YouTube. We're happy to be here. It's a little late. I, I tend to be a little slow in these things, but we are here to stay. Tonight, I, I want to talk to you about vengeance and revenge. You know, in this modern world that we're living in, particularly in our society with so many things that are happening right now, emotions are running high. And it seems like if somebody does something to us, we want to strike out and do the same thing, if not worse, to someone else. You ever feel that way? I have felt that way, including recently. You, somebody does an evil to you, and the first thing we want to do is get back at him. That is, a, that is just a normal human emotion. You hurt me, I'm going to turn around and hurt you. You insult me. I'm going to insult you. But what does God really say when it comes to vengeance or having revenge or having avenging one thing for another? What does God say about that? Well, I'm going to introduce you to a person tonight that you may or may not be familiar with. If you have your Bibles, we're going to start tonight. We're going to look at a few different passages. We are going to start tonight in 2 Timothy chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles in Bereans, you always should have your Bibles with you. We're going to look at a passage in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we're going to look there and I'm going to introduce you to a man named Alexander the coppersmith. It's not much said about him, but what is said about him is devastating. And we need to look at that and pay attention to that in light of what is happening in today's world because there's so many of us that want to just reach out and get revenge for some things that have happened and I understand those feelings but we also want to be good Bereans and we want to see what God has to say about it now second Timothy is generally understood to be Paul's last writing he, as he's sending this letter to Timothy his young son in the faith who was also the pastor at, at the church of Ephesus he was getting some last things in order. And in chapter 4, he starts talking to Timothy. And I've preached on this passage before about preaching the word in season and out of season, always being ready. But then Paul talks about fighting the good fight and that he has put, he's run the race. He's ready to be sacrificed. And not too long after this letter was written, Paul was killed by the emperor Nero in Rome. But I want to make, I, I want you to see here, if you have your Bibles, I gave you a moment to get there. Verse 9, I want to read this passage to you because these are Paul's like concluding thoughts on this earth. He says in verse 9 as he's writing to Timothy, Make every effort to come to me soon. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. That's Luke, by the way, who wrote the Gospel, Luke, Dr. Luke. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. But Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus and the books, especially the parchments. And here's what I want you to see. Verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Verse 15. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. There's this man, first of all, coppersmith. What is Paul talking about with coppersmith? He is talking about anyone that works with metal. It could be a silversmith, a goldsmith, a coppersmith, basically someone who was skilled and works with metal. I remember when I was in high school, I had one of my classes was metal shop. Oh, I hated it. I did not like working with metal. It wasn't a surface that I enjoyed and it wasn't a material that I enjoyed working with. Well, that's what Alexander was. That's what he did for a living. He was a coppersmith. Now imagine, we read about all kinds of characters in scripture here. We read about the good ones like David, and then we read about the bad ones like Judas. Alexander the coppersmith, based on what Paul is writing, will forever be known as someone who betrayed the faith. His name is not written in the book of life. 
based on everything that Paul is saying, and I'll show you another passage in a minute, but Paul is giving a warning to Timothy and to all else who are reading this, that Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. Now, we want to keep this in context. Paul was not talking about personal harm. He was talking about the cause of Christ. He was talking about Paul's ministry, not something that happened to Paul personally. We need to make sure that we understand that. It says here, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay. That's our first indication that God is going to handle things. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. The Lord rewards and the Lord disciplines or punishes according to our deeds, according to what we do. Now look at verse 15 here of 2 Timothy 4. He says, be on guard against him yourself. Timothy and everyone else reading this letter, you be on guard against this Alexander. It says here, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. Somehow or other, Alexander was a rebel rouser. He stirred up the troops. He gazed, got people against what Paul was teaching. We read about an Alexander in Acts chapter 19. And my guess is, since there's not a lot about Alexander, that it's all the same person. Well, Acts 19, if you go and read that at around verse 32 or 33, it talks about that Alexander was a Jew and he was stirring up the people in Ephesus. And it keeps coming back to Ephesus here because Timothy, Paul established his church at Ephesus and he left Timothy behind to be the pastor at Ephesus. And if you read the, the letter to the Ephesians, Paul is constantly giving instructions to the Ephesian church. Well, here's this Alexander who was trying to turn people against the faith. And what Paul is saying here in 2 Timothy 4 verse 14 is that God will repay him for his deeds. There's no need for Paul to take action. There's no need to censure him. There's no need to go after him. Now, let me explain this before we go any further. Because we human beings, and I'm guilty of it too, until I learned better, us human beings tend to think when we hear of words like revenge and vengeance to be a one-on-one -on -one thing. You hurt me, so I'm going to get my revenge on you. You did something to me. I'm going to do something to you. But is that what God really teaches? Did Jesus really teach us to do that? Jesus taught us things like, and he showed us that when he was reviled, he did not revile back at them. Jesus taught us that when someone strikes you on the cheek, you give them the other cheek. It hardly sounds like teaching where Jesus says, okay, I want you to go out and be vigilantes. I want you to go out and repay evil for evil. It is God's job. Now, here's what we need to understand. We, as human beings, get caught up and understand that we think the word revenge and vengeance means I'm going to get you. But if you look at the root word of vengeance, avenge, and revenge, the root of that has to do with punishment or discipline. Now, when you go out and somebody harms you and you turn around and you harm someone else, we can justify and call it just punishment. We're just being vigilantes at that point. We're just taking the law into our own hands. We're doing what we feel is justified. But the way God talks about revenge and vengeance is in more of a, it's a spiritual sense. When God is going to repay, he's going to repay for those that have turned against him. I want to show you what I'm talking about. Turn with me a few pages back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. This was the very first letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. And you're going to see this man Alexander pop up again. I'm going to start in verse 18 of 1 Timothy chapter 1. Now stay with me, Boreans. In verse 18 of 1 Timothy 1, it says, This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Now watch this in verse 20. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander. And look what happens here. Whom I have handed over to Satan so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. Oh, 
Now, wait a minute. If this is the same Alexander, and most Bible scholars, including myself, not that I'm a scholar, but as a Bible, as a Bible reader and teacher, I believe this is the same Alexander. Because Paul is talking about the same thing. He had to hand over Hymenaeus, we don't know much about him, and this dreaded Alexander here. But here, instead of saying what he says in verse in uh, 2 Timothy, where the Lord will repay, what does he say here? I've turned him over to Satan. It's like when Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 1 that God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Alexander was causing so much problems, so many issues. What happened? Paul simply had to dismiss him and pull back from him and say, well, if this is what you're going to believe, if these are the kind of things you're going to preach, if this is the opposition we're going to have, instead of Paul taking it into his own hands and doing something, he's saying, I simply have turned these guys over to Satan so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. When we talk about blaspheme, that's a specific type of sin. When you blaspheme against God, that's a very serious charge. So whatever Hymenaeus and whatever Alexander were up to, whoever they were trying to influence, whatever kind of strife they were causing among the people, it was pretty severe. So when we look at Alexander, we see on the one, the first Timothy, where Paul says, I've turned him over to Satan. So that he will not learn, he will learn not to blaspheme. But by the time he gets to Second Timothy, which he wrote some time later, now this Alexander is still around. He's still among the people. He's still in the area. And now Paul's saying, not only did I turn him over to Satan, but now the Lord will repay according to his deeds. See, all of us are going to stand before the judgment throne of God. When our time here on earth is done, all of us, Jesus told us, will have to give an account for his or her life as to how we lived our life. Did we live it in a God-glorifying way? The most important question is, did we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior? Because that is the only way we can get into heaven. The only way. Jesus told us that himself in John 14, 6. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. There is no other way that we can get into heaven except through Jesus Christ. That is a fact. You either accept that as biblical truth or you dismiss it at your own peril. But all of us are going to stand before the judgment seat and give an account for our life. Alexander the coppersmith will stand before the Lord Jesus and give an account for his life. And imagine... You're being written about in Scripture, and forevermore, your name is associated with blasphemy. Your name is associated with being turned over to Satan. Your name is being associated where the Lord is going to repay you according to your deeds. And there's a warning to stay away from this man, Alexander. Well, there are many, and listen to me, there are many Alexanders in the world today. There are many people that blaspheme against the name of Christ. There are many people who do not believe that Jesus is the Lord and Savior. They have rejected him. They have rejected the gospel. They have rejected the Bible. They want nothing to do with it. And I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about Christianity. I'm talking about faith. I'm talking about faith and, and understanding that all of us are sinners saved by grace and we must accept Jesus to be our Lord and Savior. We must accept him or we have no chance, zero chance. People get mad at me when I say this, but read the Bible for yourself. You can't get into heaven without Jesus. That's a plain and simple Bible truth. And you reject that at your own peril. Well, here we have this Alexander. And what's fascinating about him is he was around Paul. He heard the gospel firsthand from Paul. He would have seen these churches probably, at least some of them, come up. He certainly was around in Ephesus. He would have been familiar with who Timothy was and some of the other workers. And yet, he turned against Paul. He turned ultimately against his own faith. And he will be ever known as a heretic. He's a false, he's a, he was a false believer. He didn't really believe. We could put him in the same category like Judas. Judas went around with Jesus for three years, and yet Judas was a traitor. 
Judas, Judas betrayed our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to get back for a moment to this, this thought about vengeance and revenge. Do you know where it first shows up? You have to go all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 32 to see where God actually says the phrase, vengeance is mine. It's in Deuteronomy 32. And just in case you think it's an Old Testament concept that God had vengeance back then, and as you read the Old Testament, did God have vengeance on the enemies of God's people? He sure did. Did he not wipe out nations? Did he not send the Israelites against other nations? Did he not? Do, don't we see the God of the Old Testament? I've actually had people say to me over the years, how do you reconcile the God of the Old Testament with the God of the New Testament? If you believe Jesus is God, and he's so meek, and he's mild, and he's caring, how do you reconcile that with the God of the Old Testament who was wiping out villages and countries, men, women, and children? How do you reconcile that? Because God is a righteous God. And if you read the Old Testament carefully, those people who God took vengeance against deserved it. We cannot question God. We may wonder, God, why did you do that? Why did you have to kill the babies and all that? I'm sure many of us are asking God that same kind of question. I've often wondered, Lord, couldn't you have just let the babies go? But we look at Jesus, and was he always mild, and was he always well-mannered? No! Jesus had his times with the Pharisees where he got in their face and he told them what they needed to hear, what they didn't want to hear, but he needed to say to them, you're whitewashed sepulchers, you're full of dead man's bones, the outside of you looks good, but inside you're rotten. He told the Pharisees and Sadducees that when they were selling in the temple. What did he do? He went in and he drove them out. He threw furniture over. Jesus got violent when he needed to get violent. But this was the Lord Jesus doing it. Almighty God himself. We have to understand, and I know this is this is tough to reconcile with, and maybe I'm maybe I'm not explaining myself well. But it's it's too easy for us as human beings, when we're done a wrong, that the first thing we want to do is go and do wrong to someone else. It's a natural human emotion. And we have to be careful about that. Because revenge, our way of describing revenge, is not what God says revenge is. God will repay every person for their deeds. God will have the final say as to who is making it into heaven and who's not, based on whether we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. I want to show you something else, all right? Go with me a few more books back to the book of Romans, chapter 12, okay? Romans, chapter 12, one of the great chapters in all of Scripture. In case you're wondering, well, did God really say not to have revenge on other people and be careful about that? Yeah, he sure did. Romans 12 Verse 19, listen to this. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Okay. In verse 21, he goes a little further down, just a couple verses left. I just saw this. It says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, I know what you're saying. That person did me wrong. I just want to get them back. I grew up, as many of you know, I grew up in Philadelphia. And I, it's a tough town. And I grew up that when you had a problem with someone, you handled your business right away, right then and there. And that usually meant that two people went out into the street and beat the daylights out of each other and whoever was left standing was the winner. When that was done, you shook hands, and you became friends again, and you went on with life. Now, that's not necessarily what I would call revenge. It's you get into a fight, but you see, you, you can get into a mindset where suddenly somebody says something to you, and the first thing you want to do is go back and get them. They stuck me, I'm going to stick to them. They hurt me, I'm going to hurt them. That is not... And I know this is difficult to understand. It's difficult for me to understand. 
But the Bible is, is clear to me that God will have the vengeance. God will do the repaying. God will have the revenge. But it's going to come in a bigger, in, in a bigger way than just physical things on earth. You and I could get into, into physical scrapes with one another because we're upset. Or we can, we, we can take our, our vengeance out on material things because we're angry about something. And I'm not supporting what's going around as far as those that loot and those that destroy property. I believe we should be able to protest, and we do. And I believe we should be able to speak our minds, and we do. But if we mean business with God, we've got to let God handle things that God says he will handle. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, when we're oppressed, when we're beaten up, when we're slandered, what the first thing we want to do when we get slandered is, I'm going to take them to court. I'm going to sue them. We're sue crazy. We live in a society where all we want to do is just sue one another. Is that biblical? That's for another matter, another time. What I, what I just wanted to come on here and share with you for a few minutes was this. That here we have Alexander, the coppersmith, who was so wrong, who did so many things that were against what Paul was teaching, that he literally was turned over to Satan so that he could be taunted even more by Satan. When you're given up over to Satan, there's no hope for you once you go. And apparently Alexander didn't learn his lesson because a little while later, Paul then says, well, God is going to repay him for his deeds. But listen, you stay away from him. And so Christians, let me talk to you on this level as well. There are Alexanders in the world that will try to disrupt your faith. There are Alexanders in this world that will do whatever they can to knock you off your focus of Scripture, of Jesus, of Christianity. And Christians are being persecuted around the world. You and I are not being persecuted here in America the way our brothers and sisters are around the world. They're being persecuted. They are being persecuted. Many of them are losing their lives or they're in jail. Many people in many countries cannot even do what you and I are doing right now, and that is be on social media and talk about the things of God and talk about Scripture and talk about Jesus. If I was in a country that, like North Korea or in another country like that, they could arrest me, they would kill me for what I'm doing right now. And so... When we come across the Alexanders of this world, of course we want to pray for them because they're lost. But don't let an Alexander drive you into such a state where you want to have revenge on them, where you want to get even with them because they hurt you. This is a lesson that I had to learn recently. And I don't know who's watching. And if this applies to you, then this applies to you. I'm not mentioning any names. But... Recently, I had to overcome the desire, the burning desire to get revenge. And as God was leading me through these scriptures, he was saying to me, Thomas, getting revenge and being vengeful and avenging a wrong that you see as a wrong is not for you to do. It's for me to do. So leave it with me. And this has been the hard lesson that I've had the last couple of days as I've wrestled with Alexander. And I've seen, based on what Scripture says, that he was not a nice guy. He was not a nice man. He did some horrible things. And we're going to run across the Alexanders in this world, and we need to be careful of them. This wasn't just an isolated thing for Timothy to do thousands of years ago. This is for us as well. The Alexanders that are going to try to get us to fight them or get us off of our square or get our focus off of Jesus, off the Bible, away from church is going to do what they can to antagonize us. When we come across the Alexanders of this world, we need to have, we need to remember what Jesus did. When he was reviled, he did not revile again. When they slapped his cheek, he just took it on the other cheek. Jesus did not, because ultimately, 
Jesus is going to have the final say as Almighty God. He is going to repay everyone according to their deeds. So it's not up to you and it's not up to me to go after someone the minute they hurt us or say something we don't like or slander us in some kind of way. We need to be able to be bigger than that and realize that God will have the final say. The Lord will repay. It's a promise. He will repay. Tough lesson. I know. You may not agree with what I've just stated here, but I invite you to search the scriptures also and be a diligent brand. Acts 17.11 tells us that the Brands were more noble than all others. They weren't smarter. They didn't have more on the ball. What they did was this, that when Paul and Silas were preaching to them, they heard the word with all eagerness. They were ready to hear the word. They wanted to hear the word. But then they took it one step further and they searched the scriptures daily, every single day, to make sure what they were hearing was true. You need to do that. If you disagree with something I said, that's perfectly okay. Search the scriptures for yourself to make sure what you just heard, what you were just taught, what I just preached on, is true. And if it's not true, then God will show me that what I taught was not true or not as accurate as it could have been. And God will also show you. But we need to be diligent Bereans. We need to realize that God is in control of all of this. It may not look like it at times. It may look like we're living in a chaotic society and there's no rules of order and everything is going haywire. God knows exactly what's going on. And God is in charge. And sometimes God being in charge means to step back and let us do what we need to do and then he steps in. Sometimes if you read scripture, God doesn't always intervene right away. Sometimes he lets us go a while and then he jumps in. Other times he gets involved right away. But that's God's prerogative. And so be a diligent Berean. Study your scriptures, the passages I looked at, and read through them. And make sure that God is saying what I said that he says. Also, if this has been a blessing to you, Please feel free to share it. Isaiah 55, 11 tells us that God's word does not return void. It reaches all those he intends it to reach. So if this reached you tonight, if you're wrestling with this subject tonight, if you are having a conflict between taking vengeance on someone and having revenge against someone versus what God is saying, this would be a good thing to send out to other people as we wrestle together with this very difficult concept command god tells us don't take revenge on someone else leave room for the wrath of god you know what i don't ever want to be under the wrath of god do you the wrath of god is eternal the wrath of god is eternal when god gets mad at you that's being mad when god has to correct you that's serious business and so as i wrap this up i pray that it has been a blessing Please feel free to share it. Be a diligent brain. May I say thanks to all of you who have been praying for this ministry, praying for me, as we have gone through the last several weeks, a time of trial, a time of newness, a, a time of a new direction. There was a major upheaval, as many of you know, just a few weeks ago, and our life took a 360-degree turn. We're now in that new turn. We're seeking where God will have us next. In the meantime, I know that social media is part of it. I know that preaching and teaching the Word of God is part of it. And I'm going to stay doing that. So please continue to pray for me that I would be strong, that I would stay healthy, unwavering, bold, on the front lines for Jesus Christ. No sugarcoating the gospel here. No picking and choosing what we're going to teach on and what we're not going to teach on. All of the Bible needs to be taught. All the Bible needs to be preached on. That's what you get at this ministry here. Thank you also to those who have supported us recently financially. There are a few of you who have done that. You know who you are. You know how much you're appreciated. We sent those receipts out to you. And if you feel led to support us financially, you don't have to. I saw something today that was posted on one of the sites that I was looking at where they had to, they were actually charging to get a prophecy. I, I kid you not. They were charging. You had to pay someone so that you get a prophecy. That's ridiculous. It has nothing to do with the Bible. You don't have to do that here. You want me to pray for you or you need counseling or whatever? I'm here all the time. I'm here for all of you throughout my various platforms. You know that. But if God would lead you to support us financially, 
it would be a great help. We have a benevolent fund that we've set up to help other people. And we, of course, have ministry expenses because right now this is a total walk of faith. There's no, there's no income here, zero. There's nothing. But we're trusting God to lead us forward as to where he wants us to go. And I'm grateful that we're on social media. I'm grateful that we can interact with you so many times during the week. So if God would lead you to do that, get in touch with me and I can show you the easiest way that would work for you. But if not, please make sure you subscribe to YouTube. Please make sure you're on alert here on Facebook and whatever other platform we're using. We're also on Twitter. Make sure that you're in touch with us. If there's anything that we can do to help with you and your walk with Jesus, we would be very glad to do that. Well, I thank you for being with me for this uh, brief little lesson, this sermon, this study, whatever you want to call it here on this Thursday evening. I pray that it blessed you. Thanks for being with me. God bless.